Are we ready? A good question to ask maybe. It's a powerful block, one that commands the buying power and the brain power of 630 million people. Rich in diversity, whether it's in cultures, ethnicities, economies, or people, the ASEAN region is all about opportunities, or so it should be. But is it being harnessed? That's another story. Sri Lanka, on the other hand, has inked FTAs as well as strengthened bilateral ties with various individual countries within the ASEAN region. And in similar fashion, China, India, Singapore, Malaysia, and even countries like Indonesia, Thailand, and uh, the Philippines have used the opportunity to make collective efforts to make sure that they maximize on the opportunities of the region. But we do need a collective block to be powerful, to be dynamic, and to be vibrant. Is Sri Lanka taking advantage? That's to be seen. And that is the question that's going to be answered today. So welcome, everyone, to the ASEAN Sri Lanka's Next Big Opportunity Management Conference, organized by the MBA Alumni Association of the University of Colombo and the Daily FT in strategic partnership with HSBC. We'd also like to say thank you to our electronic media partner, Sri Lanka Rupavahini Corporation, and creative partner, Redworks. And with that introduction to the event this morning, I'd like to invite to make the formal welcome address the president of the MBA Alumni Association of the University of Colombo, Irshan Jaya. Good morning, all of you. Our chief guest, Dr. Indrajit Kumar of Swami, the governor of Central Bank of Sri Lanka, who will join us shortly. Mrs. Stuart Rogers, Head of Wholesale Banking, HSBC Sri Lanka and Maldives, and other bank officials from HSBC Sri Lanka, Dean, and members from the Faculty of Management and Finance, University of Colombo, Chief Editor of Daily FT, Nista Kasim, and his team, past presidents, and my fellow colleagues, from MB Alumni Association, University of Colombo, eminent speakers, expert panelists, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to the Management Conference 2018, ASEAN, Sri Lanka's next big opportunity. On behalf of MB Alumni Association, and our partner, Daily FT. The MBA Alumni Association is a volunteer organization which consists of diverse and dynamic MBA graduates from University of Colombo. We analyzed social, economic, and professional dynamics in the country through various activities and programs, such as management conferences, budget seminars, and evening discussions. Today, we feature our eighth management conference. The conference is all about international trade opportunities in ASEAN region. It is impressive to note that today, the West is looking at the East for business opportunities. The Sri Lankan government, as well as the business community, are also looking for ways and means to strategize trading partnerships with the East, thereby to reducing the reliance on traditional markets such as Europe and Americas. It is timely and important that we, as an independent association, bring this topic into the discussion. We are proud we have been able to facilitate a forum which could make a significant impact to Sri Lankan economy. We are grateful to our central bank governor for agreeing to come for this event despite his busy schedule. A big thank you to 
our eminent speakers and panelists for agreeing to join us today. We thank HSBC Sri Lanka for facilitating us to conduct this forum for the second consecutive year by joining us as a strategic partner. We thank our creative partner, Redworks, electronic media partner, Sri Lanka Rupahini Corporation, and our partner, Daily FT, for their continuous support and commitment. Let's start the proceedings. I hope you will enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you very much to Ishan Jaya. And like he said, let's start the proceedings. So to make the opening remarks, I would like to invite the head of wholesale banking of HSBC, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives, Stuart Rogers. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and a very warm welcome to this management forum. We are honored to have you joining us here today. HSBC aims to be where growth is, helping businesses to thrive and economies to prosper. HSBC's strategy is to use its international network to capture the global trade, capital, and wealth creation flows between the world's faster growing markets. ASEAN is a dynamic trading block of 10 countries with strong individual fundamentals. Amongst its 10 members, ASEAN is already home to some of the fastest growing economies in Asia and across the world, including Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia. The 10 ASEAN countries combined GDP stood at US $2.6 trillion in 2016. It has grown by about 5% a year for nearly two decades and quadrupled since 2000 in dollar terms. Our focus on ASEAN demonstrates the role HSBC believes it will play in powering growth in the region. The potential economic and demographic dividend that ASEAN presents will be greater when the region can be treated as a whole, not only the sum of the parts. More than 220 of the world's largest companies with annual revenues in excess of 1 billion US dollars are headquartered in ASEAN, and numerous international corporate giants have manufacturing and other sites in the region. Sri Lankan apparel companies expanding their footprint to Vietnam or to Indonesia is a good example of this. That's why HSBC believes that helping our clients to build and sustain trade corridors with ASEAN countries is a very sensible way of achieving growth. Apart from the ease of business it offers to companies with their trade and business policies, if you look at the ASEAN consumer, ASEAN's 650 million inhabitants are an increasingly powerful source of global demand and potential game changer for companies that are looking for growth in a tough and uncertain global environment. To tap into the potential of ASEAN companies, companies need to adapt their business models to adapt to the diversity in the block. ASEAN spans a wide array of religions, cultures, and languages, multiple political systems, and vastly varying levels of economic development. A one-size-fits-all business approach is not a recipe for success. At the same time, the region is sprawling and physically disjointed. For example, the 260 million plus inhabitants of Indonesia alone are spread out over thousands of islands wider, with, wider than the span of the USA. Infrastructure links in many parts of Southeast Asia remain underdeveloped or overloaded. All this means is that ASEAN's enormous potential is sometimes still not fully appreciated. If ASEAN were a nation, it would have the world's seventh largest economy currently. By 2030, it's estimated to be the fourth largest economy globally. Accenture estimates that annual consumer spending will rise to 2.3 trillion US dollars by 2020, which represents an 80% increase over 2012 levels. The number of middle class households in ASEAN will top more than 120 million by 2025, roughly doubling from 2010. This will help boost spending on anything from white and brown goods to travel and entertainment to insurance and education. I'd like today to be a conversation starter about the potential of ASEAN everyone in the room should think about whether it's your next big opportunity. If you believe it is, as we at HSBC do, then our in-depth knowledge of the region and our strong presence in Asia will provide you with the expertise you require to navigate ASEAN. 
Again, thank you for joining us here today, and please enjoy the rest of your day. There's the landscape for ASEAN, what's and all, and uh, well, how much potential is there? We're going to find out. Navigating changing global trade policy environment will be what uh, Douglas Lippold, the HSBC's chief trade economist, will be discussing. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've had some interesting conversations already this morning. I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion. So I'll set the stage a bit with some global perspectives, uh, and then I'll move to more specific conditions in the region. This is a map of the top 20 trade corridors around the world. Um, and you'll see that as of 2016, eight or nine of them, it varies a little bit by year, uh, were anchored in China. Uh, the other uh, ends of these corridors are anchored in North America, Western Europe, and Japan. So that's a picture of the world trade. And businesses in developing or emerging market economies have depended on plugging into value chains to get access to these uh, large trade corridors. Um, and uh, uh, Sri Lanka has been quite successful in doing this. Uh, in particular, we have uh, textiles and apparel, where, but also agriculture, where Sri Lanka has been able to plug in. Going forward, I think this picture is about to begin changing quite dramatically. I think we're going to see a shift toward the south coming through quite strongly. HSBC estimates that by the year 2050, there could be 2.6 billion new members of the middle class in, across 17 emerging market economies. And something happens uh, to the pattern of consumption when consumers go from having incomes uh, below about $5,000 per capita, they're focused on basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, things that are largely sourced locally. Above that threshold, however, consumer patterns change. Uh, consumers have more disposable income. They start looking to substitute um, higher quality products. They start shopping to look at brand. Uh, they become more aware of brand. Uh, and the differences um, in, in, in quality or product features. They start uh, at, a, at, a, in a, at a poor income level. They may be worried about acquiring uh, some basic protein and rice. In the middle class, above this threshold, they may start worrying about where to source uh, some organic uh, uh, grass-fed lamb from New Zealand or something like this. It's a different perspective. And it becomes, the, the pattern of consumption becomes much more uh, trade intensive above that threshold. If we see this uh, uh, surge of new consumers, hundreds of millions of new consumers entering the market in emerging market economies, they're going to begin to shape demand. If you look at a company like the Chinese uh, telephone company, Xiaomi, they're making mobile phones first and foremost for emerging markets and developing economies. They're not targeting the older uh, developed market economies. And I think they've recognized that there's this potential coming through now. And uh, I think we'll see more, um, there'll be a more balanced picture of trade going forward where south-south trade among the emerging markets becomes more important. And it's not something for the developed economies to fear. Protectionism is not the right response to this situation. Developed economies, such as my own, the United States, should engage. It's a source of growth. We can have win-win scenarios where the advanced economies can supply some of the equipment uh, and services that the emerging markets need to develop. So I think, think there's some very positive trends. And we'll see a different picture of world trade um, in the coming decade. But for now, where are we now? This is a picture showing the evolution of global exports year by year in the red bars and the evolution of GDP in the black line. And what I'd like to highlight is that in the first part of this century, trade was growing at two and three times the pace of GDP. The world was becoming more trade intensive. And for me as a trade economist, that made me very happy. And the reason is that I know 
we have not yet exploited all of the opportunities to have improved productivity, to have growth that enables businesses to reap the gains from economies of scale on opportunities to look and identify niche markets that they can consolidate and, and um, outcompete the competition through innovation, um, uh, through quality or innovation or product feature innovation that enables them to, uh, to reap, to build a moat, to have a better position in the market. We hit the Great Recession, that's the big swing you see in the middle, and after that, trade uh, grew at a much uh, slower pace than in the first part of the century. Businesses became more cautious. We saw supply chains being consolidated, fewer steps, lowering risk, um, and uh, I think some of the opportunities that had been locked, unlocked in the previous decade with the advent of the WTO, with China, joining the WTO in 2001. I think some of the opportunities had been tapped into by business already. And when we got to 2015 and 2016, we saw restructuring in China, a shift from investment-led, export-led growth toward a more uh, domestic focus, uh, greater emphasis on growth through consumer, uh, through consumption, the consumer uh, claiming a bigger share of the Chinese economy and the closure of some plants for environmental concerns. This led to weakness in the world market, commodity prices in particular, demand fell, and we saw trade not even keeping pace with the growth in GDP globally. The world became less trade intensive during 2015 and 16, and I have to say, as a trade economist, this kept me up at night. I was disturbed by this because I know that we were going in the wrong direction in the interest of businesses, but also in the interest of consumers around the world. And thank goodness we saw in 2017, China had worked through some of its adjustment, some of its reorientation. China was back in the, in the market. Demand for commodities was rising globally. So we had a very strong 2017, exports of goods and services growing at about 5.2% globally. That's a huge, uh, um, in absolute terms, it's, that represents a huge growth, actually. Here in Sri Lanka, I also understand there's been good progress on the single window implementation, uh, and that's a healthy uh, basis for reducing mutually non-tariff barriers. Trade agreements with the ASEAN countries can be very helpful in reducing these non-tariff barriers and promoting access to the market. And it's, they have a particular role uh, for a country like uh, Sri Lanka that might wish to sell products into the ASEAN market because some ASEAN countries still maintain relatively high tariff barriers as well as non-tariff barriers toward the outside world. Free trade agreements are a way to, to minimize those, but also they commit governments on both sides of the deal to lock in their commitments to each other. They provide recourse as well in the event of a dispute. And that increases the certainty. And certainty is a, uh, a, and a very important driver of bilateral trade and investment. For businesses to undertake a long-term commitment to another market, it's a great advantage if the rules of the game are known in advance, if the systems are transparent. And that's something that bilateral free trade agreements can deliver. A very useful complement to free trade agreements in the region is the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, initially a China-led initiative, now it's become more inclusive. After the Belt and Road Forum last year, last May in Beijing, we had, uh, uh, I think, a more open and transparent process for this agreement going forward. We have seed funding coming from, uh, from sources in China, but the, the it's helping to mobilize additional private sector capital to achieve uh, the improved uh, infrastructure that Asia needs. Um, ADB, the Asian Development Bank, estimates hundreds of billions of dollars of shortfall currently in Asia for um, 
the build out of infrastructure needed to maintain current rates of growth, not accelerate, just to maintain current rates of growth. According to one estimate from the academic literature, uh, from a, a, a contact uh, of ours, Fan Jai published an article in the Journal of Asian, Economic, uh, Asian Economics this year. Um, he found that if the Belt and Road Initiative continues successfully, the projects it covers could help to mobilize about $1.4 trillion or more in capital to achieve uh, implementation of the kind of infrastructure that Asia needs going forward. So the Belt and Road, I think, is an important complement to trade liberalization. It's helping to build uh, rail, road, pipeline, port connections across the region. And it also has, an, it has a non-monetary, non-financial dimension, which is it aims to improve policy coordination across the region. And that is also, uh, it has the potential to reduce the customs red tape to align the kind of information that customs uh, officers are collecting, and hopefully to, for, to promote implementation of paperless trade procedures. So to bring Sri Lanka into perspective, does Sri Lanka's future lie with ASEAN? I'd like to invite Mr. Adam Collins, who's the LK, LKI Global Economy Program Research Fellow. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank uh, Dilly FT and the MBA Alumni Association of the University of Colombo for organizing today's very timely event and inviting me to present. I should also say that the usual disclaimers apply to my presentation. The views are entirely my own and not that of my institution or anyone we are affiliated with. Um, so my presentation today is split into three parts. I'll first highlight some of the reasons why Sri Lanka should be seeking closer ties with ASEAN. I'll then outline where Sri Lanka's links with ASEAN stand today and conclude with three policy priorities that I believe are crucial in deepening this relationship. So why should Sri Lanka seek closer ties with ASEAN? We've already heard quite a lot about this, but to add more detail from Sri Lanka's perspective, as it, looks, as it tries to position itself as a hub in the Indian Ocean region, why not focus on South Asia or the potential of East and Southern Africa? Why is ASEAN an immediate draw. Starting with the basics, um, as we've already heard, the 10 countries of ASEAN, shown here in blue, have a combined population of over 600 million and accounted for 3.5% of world GDP, as well as 7.3% of world goods trade last year. And at the risk of stating the obvious, it's also relatively nearby. While Sri Lanka is generally considered a South Asian economy, it's worth remembering that it's a similar distance from Colombo to Bangkok or Kuala Lumpur as it is to many of the major cities in South Asia, including New Delhi, Karachi, or Dhaka. But even more important than ASEAN's size and geographical location is its economic success. You know, admittedly, it's difficult to make sweeping generalizations given the diversity in its membership. But there are a couple of key areas that really demonstrate ASEAN's success very clearly and are, are particularly relevant for Sri Lanka. The first is, is, is its success as an exporter. This chart shows the average growth of export volumes um, from the 10 ASEAN economies between 2010 and 2017. And I've added Sri Lanka in red for comparison. As you can see, with the exception of Indonesia and Brunei, on the right-hand side of the chart, export growth in the ASEAN countries has outstripped that in Sri Lanka, and in many cases, by quite a sizable margin. Indeed, Sri Lanka's underperformance compared to ASEAN is even more clear when it comes to foreign investment. This chart is similar to the previous one, but shows average FDI inflows to the ASEAN countries as a share of their GDP. And I've done the average between 2010 and 2016 here, and I've added Sri Lanka again in red for comparison. As you can see, Sri Lanka sits all the way on the right-hand side of this chart, with average FDI inflows equivalent to just about 1% of GDP a year. This is less than any of the ASEAN economies during this period. Uh, so as such, the ASEAN economies are a compelling example of the export and investment-led growth model that Sri Lanka is trying to pursue. An important factor behind this has been their successful integration into global value chains, particularly in things like light electronics. This has in turn been helped by ASEAN's superior efforts in pursuing regional economic integration. 
To put that in perspective, interregional trade among ASEAN economies counts for about 20% of their total trade. Within South Asia, that's only 5%. So given these potential benefits, where do Sri Lanka's links with ASEAN stand today? Starting with the formal links, diplomatic ties have historically been very cordial. Sri Lanka has diplomatic missions in seven ASEAN states, with the only exceptions being Brunei, Laos, and Cambodia. It has also been a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum since 2007, though this only really discusses regional security issues. In terms of formal economic links, Sri Lanka has bilateral investment treaties with five ASEAN members, most of which were signed in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and these treaties define the rights of Sri Lankan investors in these countries and vice versa. Aside from the recent free trade agreement with Singapore, however, Sri Lanka is not involved in any other trade agreements with ASEAN members. And so trade is largely based on World Trade Organization rules. This means that Sri Lanka faces the same barriers as any other country that doesn't have a trade agreement with ASEAN as a whole or any of its members. I mean, admittedly, this has not stopped trade between Sri Lanka and ASEAN growing. Bilateral trade in goods amounted to $3.7 billion last year, which accounts for about 10% of Sri Lanka's total trade. But the details of this trade are less encouraging, as it, this trade is heavily skewed towards imports. The red line on this chart shows Sri Lanka's goods imports from ASEAN as a share of its total imports, while the blue line shows Sri Lanka's exports to ASEAN as a share of its total exports. This, this chart also covers the time period since ASEAN's establishment in 1967, which is shown by the dash line on the left-hand side of this chart. As you can see, while both lines have moved upwards since the 1960s, imports from ASEAN have been consistently more important than exports. Indeed, while Sri Lanka's imports from ASEAN have fluctuated at around 15% of total imports over the past couple of decades, exports have been stuck at around 5% of Sri Lanka's total exports. The result is that Sri Lanka has had a continuous trade deficit with ASEAN since its formation. And while that deficit has narrowed slightly in recent years, it still amounted to $2.7 billion last year. Now, we can add a bit more color to this picture by breaking it down by country. The blue bars on this chart show the value of Sri Lanka's goods exports to each of the ASEAN countries. While the, while the red bars show below the zero line show Sri Lanka's imports from those countries. Other than the value of imports clearly being much larger than that of exports, the other thing that stands out in this chart is that all the action is on the left-hand side, with Sri Lanka's biggest tra trading partners in ASEAN being Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. In contrast, trade with the remaining five members of ASEAN is negligible. We'd like to welcome to our midst our chief guest for the public forum today, the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy. So with his arrival, may I now invite to speak with you, the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy. Now, I'm sure you've heard a far more informed um, presentations about uh, ASEAN and the opportunity it presents uh, to Sri Lanka. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to look at the title, ASEAN Sri Lanka's Next Big Opportunity, in two parts. Uh, basically to ask two uh, questions. One is, why is it important to take advantage of this opportunity? Um, and what do we need to do to uh, make sure that these uh, advantages emanating from this opportunity materialize? And secondly, to share with you some rather tentative thoughts as to what the benefits are, uh, what constitutes this opportunity as far as ASEAN is concerned, or at least Sri Lanka's uh, relations, enhanced, deepened relations with uh, ASEAN uh, uh, can generate. So why is it important to take advantage of this opportunity? Um, I think those of you who heard me before would have heard me say this uh, several times. 
uh, our growth strategy has to have exports and FDI as two key pillars. If you're a country with a population of 21 million, per purchasing power of 4,000 US dollars, clearly domestic demand can only take you so far. You certainly can't get five, six, seven percent growth on a sustained basis as the countries to the east of us have done, a number of countries to the east of us have done, by just focusing on domestic demand. So exports have to be part of the, uh, the growth narrative in a very integral way. Uh, that's one. Uh, and, and this is the case. If you look at, look at the successful countries in East and Southeast Asia, uh, whether they are as large as China uh, or as, as small as Singapore, uh, export expansion has been a key part of their economic transformation. Um, and then, if you look at it, for, uh, one must say that Japan and Korea, South Korea, you have their separate. They, their uh, economic transformation was not driven quite as much by exports, but that happened at a separate time, uh, the pre kind of WTO world, and also there were specific circumstances related to uh, the Marshall Plan at the end of the Second World War for Japan and the assistant Korea got after the Korean War. So those were separate set of circumstances. But if you look at all the other countries in Asia, as I say, as large as China or as small as Singapore, exports have played a key role in their uh, economic transformation. And also if you look at the process of export transformation, FDI has played a key role. Again, the same. Biggest China, smallest Singapore, all the countries in between, FDI has played a very key role in uh, export transformation. So um, the opportunity of, of, of uh, which is offered by uh, greater uh, uh, deepening uh, of our relations with ASEAN countries uh, will help us to achieve this objective of putting in place a growth model that is uh, based on exports and FDI. So that is the basic rationale for saying that this is an opportunity. An opportunity because it will, as I go on, I hope you, I'll be able to convince you that this opportunity will help us to fulfill the requirements of this growth model that is uh, very much embedded in the government's 2025 uh, vision statement. I should also say, uh, before I move on from this particular segment of my remarks, uh, to share with you why I think our export performance has been so poor. Uh, our exports as a percent of GDP were 33 percent, uh, was 33 percent in 2000. It's come down to about 13 percent now. Our share of global exports was 0.086. Uh, in 2000, it's come down to 0 0.064. We've gone backwards and gone backwards significantly. And a large part of the explanatory uh, factors uh, relates to an anti-export bias in our policy framework. What do I mean by that? One, for much of the time over the last several years, and certainly over the last 10 years, uh, the exchange rate has been overvalued. An overvalued exchange rate clearly uh, acts as a disincentive for exports, not only for exports, but also for those who produce uh, import, um, sorry, yes, import competing goods. So um, for much of the time, if you look at it, uh, essentially we've been asking our exporters to run 110 meters in a 100 meter rate race because the uh, real effective exchange rate has all, often been 7, 10% or more uh, overvalued. So that's one. So the exchange rate has not been export friendly. Secondly, we have over the last 10, 12 years introduced a series of para tariffs. Effective protection has increased significantly. Now the thing about para tariffs is that it essentially excludes you from the most dynamic component of the international trading system. Over the last 10, 20 years, it is tra intra-firm trade in Asia that has been the most dynamic component 
of the international trading system. That is basically the value chains, the supply chains of Asian companies. Now, the, the, when, when you put power tariffs, you exclude yourself. So why do I say you exclude yourselves? Because really in, in modern uh, production sharing systems, cross-border uh, value chains and production sharing systems, production sharing networks, the distinction between exports and imports get significantly blurred. You need to bring stuff in, do your little bit in the production sharing network, and get it out. If you stick power tariffs in the middle, you become uncompetitive. So basically, through all these power tariffs that we've introduced, we have excluded ourselves from that whole narrative of uh, the global uh, and regional production sharing networks. Uh, and that has been one of the main reasons why uh, our uh, export performance has been constrained. So ex in terms of the overall macroeconomic policy frameworks, two major constraints which have held back export expansion have been the exchange rate and these para tariffs. Of course, there are a number of institutional factors. Uh, there are a number of other factors which also have to come together, which I'll now get to, uh, to ensure that uh, exports uh, expand and that the FDI that you need to uh, support export expansion comes in. Now, if I say a little bit about FDI before I get on to the next segment of my remarks, uh, clearly, I mean, it helps us to uh, fill the savings investment gap. That is well known. Uh, and it helps us to access markets, that is well known. Uh, but is, what is also well known, but was really brought home to me most recently uh, by some of the work uh, that Professor Ricardo Hausmann has done, uh, FDI gets you access to know-how. That is critical. To move to a more complex export basket, to diversify the export uh, basket, to make it complex, so that we are able to create higher value employment because we are no longer a low uh, wage economy. So we need to create higher value employment. For that, we need a more complex uh, basket of exports and FDI plays an important role in moving to a more complex basket of exports. If you look at the export basket for Thailand around 1980 and ours, it's pretty much the same in terms of complexity. You look at it now, dramatically different. Thailand is way ahead. If you look at Vietnam, as late as probably just before the turn of the century, again, same place. You look at it now, Vietnam is way ahead. And FDI has been a crucial factor in helping those countries get a more complex uh, and more diversified export basket. And in the process, they have also diversified their destinations in terms of exports, whereas ours is still over 50% goes to the US and, uh, and um, Europe. Uh, and we haven't really um, got enough new products, complex products, other than the ICT sector. I mean, garments is a relatively old story now. Um, and even the garments, we basically was not something that grew out of our policy framework uh, and uh, it wasn't a kind of natural organic development. The garment sector got going because of the multi-fiber agreement and the quotas that came with the multi-fiber agreement. That is not something that is going to be replicated in other sectors. So we got a big leg up from the quotas and then you got some FDI which came in, which worked with our local companies and now of course we have world-class companies. But that that initial leg up of having quotas is not something we're going to get for other sectors today. So we have to create the li right policy environment, the right institutional support to boost our exports. And we need to get FDI in to support the process. Okay, so what are we doing to facilitate this in terms of export growth and, uh, and FDI uh, attraction? Now, uh, when you are sitting in my seat, you, you have to talk about stability and, and uh, the macroeconomic 
fundamentals. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry if uh, all of you have heard this before, but I feel that this is almost an article of faith that I have to go through. And uh, so really, what is being done to improve the macroeconomic fundamentals of the country? Four frameworks are being put in. One, the main source of instability in the system for many years now has been the government's budgetary operations. So now is a, f uh, a revenue enhancement based fiscal consolidation process that is currently underway. Uh, it's part of the uh, extended fund facility arrangement, but whether there is an extended fund facility or not, whether the IMF is here or not, this is something we have to do. We have to get our fiscal house in order because the excess demand that has been pumped into the system through the government's fiscal operations over the years has meant that we have been a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, overvalued currency economy. Exactly, diametrically, 180 degrees the opposite of the successful countries of East and Southeast Asia, which ran disciplined budgets, had uh, low inflation, low um, uh, uh, and stable nominal interest rates, and a competitive and often undervalued currency. So we have done exactly the opposite, which is why we have fallen so far behind those successful countries of East and Southeast Asia. One of the reasons we have fallen behind. So we have to get the fiscal um, uh, house in order, and there it's encouraging, because for the first, second time since 1955, last year there was a primary surplus in the budget. And hopefully this year, we will have a current account surplus for the first time since 1987. So some of the structural problems in the budget are being addressed, and the VAT reforms played a major part. The tax administration uh, improvements through the introduction of technology is another factor. And of course, from April 1st this year, hopefully, the new Inland Revenue Act will also help us to, one, uh, increase the revenue base, and two, to move towards a fairer, uh, uh, tax system. Now I see like, all of us are complaining that we have to pay more tax. We have 83% of our taxes collected through indirect taxes. When it comes to indirect taxes, the poorest man in Sri Lanka and the richest man in Sri Lanka pays the same rate. That is not the basis on which taxation should be effected. So we need to have a better outcome. We need to go to about a 60-40 uh, distribution between direct and indirect taxes. So those of us who can afford it, we have to pay our taxes. We get free education, we get free health. We, we as a people, seem to want Swedish social welfare and a Hong Kong tax rate. That does not add up. I'm sorry. It does not add up. Okay? So I think really we need to change our mindset. And those of us who, I mean, I had free education only to the age of 12, but many of us have had free education, free university education. And then we can't say we don't want to pay tax. That just doesn't, in my, in my view, uh, uh, really make sense. And we really shouldn't be imposing this kind of burden uh, in terms of taxation on the poor and a poorer and more vulnerable segment of our uh, society. We have to change it. And the Inland Revenue Act tries to do that. And I hope some of the lobbying that's going on trying to undo it uh, will not be successful because it, it just is not fair. This is not a fair tax system. It's an extremely unfair tax system. And we must change it. Um, let me, um, so on the fiscal side, fiscal consolidation, revenue enhancement. Uh, on the monetary policy side, again a framework, the central bank is uh, introducing a, uh, a flexible inflation targeting regime, which I'm sure all of you are familiar about. We are making steady progress. Uh, we have an inflation target of 4 to 6 percent. We've upgraded the forecasting uh, and modeling capacity within the central bank. Uh, we are putting in place a legal and accountability framework to support flexible inflation targeting. And in putting in this um, uh, uh, legal framework, uh, there will be, uh, I hope, uh, that's the intention, and the cabinet has approved this, there will be greater independence for the central bank. And there will, of course, be more accountability that comes with that independence. Let me uh, state certain principles. As, as far as we are concerned, uh, we do not see any cause for the pressure that there is in the uh, forex market. Clearly, there are global developments, the strength of the dollar, 
uh, U.S. interest rates normalizing, higher oil prices, all that creates a certain amount of pressure. But not the extent of the pressure we have seen. Uh, why we say that is that in the first quarter of this year, the average monthly inflow into the forex market was $2 billion U.S. dollars. In, that's in the first quarter. In April, it came down to 1.8 billion. And in May, it came down to 1.6 billion. So, but if you look at exports, if you look at remittances, you look at tourism, you look at all the other sectors, of course we haven't got the latest figures as yet, but there is no reason to believe that you should, there should have been a 20% reduction in the money coming into the forex market. That makes us think there's speculation going on. And really that is not something the central bank will tolerate. Because one, as I said, we are trying to give a competitive exchange rate. The real effective exchange rate is around 100. Reserves are at 9 billion, and with the hambant of the money that's due sometime this week, and another billion that's coming in on a syndicated loan, reserves are at historically very, very high levels. So there is no reason for this undue pressure on the exchange rate. And there's no reason why this, there should be this fall in the amount of money coming into the forex market. And those, if anybody is speculating, I must tell you that's not something we will tolerate for any length of time. And also it is really not helpful in the long run, in the enlightened self-interest of those who operate in the forex market. We have a lot of instruments we can use to restrict banks, to restrict importers, to restrict exporters. If you want to know what those measures are, please look at what my former mentor, Mr. A.S. Jawadna, who passed away recently, did in 2001. Just look and see what he did in 2001 when the currency overshot. Look at the powerful instrument we have to restrict the market. We do not want to do it. Let me repeat that. We do not want to do it. It's not good for the market. It's not good for importers. It's not good for exporters. It's not good for the economy. But if people, people speculate and impose an undue burden on the people of this country, I say that because there's a very high import component in the basic consumption bundle in this country. We are not going to allow people to speculate and impose an undue burden on the people of this country. So please, there is no reason for this kind of pressure, and we will, if necessary, use all the instruments we have to discipline the market. But we want to develop the market. In fact, recent, very soon, we will be announcing further measures to develop the exchange, foreign exchange market. We want to give the market a competitive exchange rate. We do not want to intervene in the market. We want people to be, behave responsibly and to run the market uh, in a responsible way. But we cannot, given the fact that there is such a high import component in our basic consumption bundle, to allow speculation to drive the rupee to a weaker position than it should be. And, and we have the instruments to stop that, but they are sub-optimal options. They are not good for the market, and we don't want to use them but at the same time, we need responsible behavior within the forex market to help us to develop the market and to let the market operate in the way it should. So that's foreign exchange. Finally, the final framework is the um, liability management. Uh, as you know, the uh, Active Liability Management Act uh, was passed uh, by Parliament in April. And that gives us greater headroom and flexibility to manage our external obligations, the bunching of our external obligations that is coming up ahead of us. Sri Lanka has never ever missed a single external payment uh, and uh, we are confident that provided this fiscal discipline is maintained, uh, we will not be missing any payments uh, in the future either. Uh, so those are the four frameworks that are being put in place in terms of macro stability. Um, because uh, what I'm trying to say here is that, okay, if, uh, 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 you know, essentially, as far as access to greater access to ASEAN is concerned, it will help us to achieve this growth model that we are trying to put in place. Uh, but also that we, you know, you, we, you, we won't benefit 
unless we increase supplies of goods and services. So to sub increase supplies of goods and services, you have to have sound macro fundamentals, which is why we are putting in place those frameworks. In addition, we have to strengthen the growth framework. And for that, uh, we need to strengthen our factor markets, land, labor, and, and, and capital. And there, again, the Vision 2025 document has some uh, good proposals, uh, which the government is working its way through. One could argue that it's far too slow, but at least the direction of travel is positive. Uh, on top of that, uh, uh, there is work being done to improve the uh, investment climate. Uh, the Board of Investment um, has set up, it's called SWIFT. It's a single window uh, facility uh, in the Board of Investment, and we've been working on it for a long time, but there are signs that it is now coming together. And the Board of Investment is also being much more focused. It's worked with the Harvard uh, Center for International Development to have a much more focused approach to uh, uh, investment promotion. They've identified certain sectors, and they've, they've, uh, they're going to attract anchor investors into those sectors. Equally, the Export Development Board has, I think, identified six uh, focus areas and four pillars of support. So all these things have been worked out and now need to be implemented. As far as the short term, uh, so that's, that's, sorry, that's investment and investment promotion. Trade facilitation, the single electronic window in customs, I think is very close to being operational. Uh, the Commerce Department has produced a, a portal to address the information asymmetry that constrains exporters. Um, but potentially, the jewel in the crown are these trade agreements. Uh, before coming to ASEAN, let me talk a little bit about trade agreements in general. Um, the government, I know he's under a lot of cr uh, criticism for these, uh, but I think it's important to say that there is a trade policy statement. Often I've read that people, people say that there is, the government doesn't have a, a trade policy, but there is actually a 25, 30 page document. Uh, which is the government's trade policy statement, which in my view is well written, well argued. So there is actually a trade policy statement. Also, in order to create uh, conditions which give greater uh, comfort and support to the domestic uh, enterprises, the government has passed the anti-dumping bill, anti-dumping and countervailing duties bill. It has passed the safeguards provisions bill. All these things are essentially intended to give greater comfort and support to domestic industry as some trade liberalization takes place as the trade agreements are signed. Uh, and also there is a trade adjustment package that's being worked out with the support of the World Bank and the, I think the uh, International Trade Center and European Union, which gives support to domestic industries to become more competitive. So the, the on these uh, uh, trade agreements, if we are successful in signing a trade agreement with China, uh, we are in the process of deepening and widening the one in, with India, and we have GSP plus with Europe. I do not know of any other country in ASEAN or anywhere else which has preferential access to China, India, and Europe. I don't, I don't think anybody else has preferential access to all three of those uh, large and lucrative markets. So you take that with our location 20 miles from the largest going fast economy, India. We are slap bang in the middle of the, the, the maritime uh, Silk Road uh, of the Chinese. Uh, we have easy access to the Middle East, to East Africa. We are equidistant between Europe and, and the Far East. You take the locational advantages and then you put in place this preferential access to a market of more than three billion people in China, India, uh, uh, Pakistan, Europe, uh, and now Singapore. Uh, you clearly have a real opportunity to leverage the trade investment nexus. You show that preferential access, you show the location, and you get investors to come here and locate and produce. And if we can create the macro fundamentals, if we can have political, some, de some degree of political stability, uh, and we uh, have this uh, kind of uh, trade policy, clearly that is a, a massive differentiator. 
So let me, uh, also the government is doing a couple of things in terms of quick, a quick boost to growth. The Gamparilia scheme essentially has the minor tank rehabilitation. Uh, way back in the 1980s, uh, when, uh, 19, late 70s, early 80s, when the accelerated Mahabali scheme was being considered, I remember I was seconded from the central bank to the finance ministry, and the World Bank told us, you know, rather than doing the Mahabali scheme, you should really do minor tank irrigation. You have over 20,000 of those. You rehabilitate those. You will have a much higher return than the Mahabali scheme. Now, whether that is true or not, I don't know. The World Bank told the South Koreans not to go into shipping, and, and they became the world's biggest shipbuilder. But, so they don't always get it right. Uh, but but uh, I, you know, what, the point I'm making is there is a massive return, a very high return to rehabilitating minor tanks. Uh, because in the, in the kind of rehabilitation process, you create employment, uh, you get water uh, for households and, 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 and for, uh, for ir uh, irrigation, you can have inland fisheries. There are so many things that come up with minor tank, uh, rehabilitation of minor tanks. So that is one. The government is having a program to rehabilitate these 22,000 uh, uh, minor irrigation tanks. Secondly, rural roads, and thirdly, uh, rural pullers, and fourthly, the agricultural supply chain. So in the next 18 months, high priority is going to be given to what, this is called the Gamparalia program, they're calling it, and about 80,000, uh, um, sorry, 80 billion, billion, somebody said 80 million the other day, but they uh, probably misheard me, 80 billion rupees have been allocated over the next two years for this uh, rural uh, development program. In addition, there is the Enterprise Sri Lanka program, which is really intended to focus upon SMEs, um, whereby uh, concessional credit will be available. Finally, let me get to the real subject now, which is, <laughs> is ASEAN an opportunity? How can, we, how can we take advantage of it? Let me start with the um, Singapore, Sri Lanka-Singapore uh, free trade agreement. Um, now, uh, there are lots of people here who know much more about this than I do. But for me, uh, you know, we, the most interesting part of it, I don't think we're going to be exporting large amounts to Singapore. I don't see that as a possibility. But the real advantages are, one, investment. Singaporean investment in here, because the agreement now pro provides even greater uh, uh, security in terms of a framework for Singaporean investment in this country. And the second interesting chapter for me anyway is the e-commerce chapter. Uh, to basically use uh, entry into Singapore as a platform to do e-commerce in the whole ASEAN region. So I think those are probably the two biggest potential gainers from the, uh, the Singaporean FTA in addition to whatever we can get by way of training uh, it's, and uh, transfer of know-how. Now, one of the, the, the criticisms of the agreement has been uh, this concern that there will be a flood of professionals. Now, I, I do have some difficulty with this. I have read the agreement. I do not see any provision in the agreement which allows for this. And those who criticize the agreement to my knowledge, have not cited a provision in the agreement which allows this. People say people are going to flood in. Okay, what is there in the agreement that's going to allow people to come in? I haven't seen it. And so what is important is, of course, people can criticize things, and they have every right to do so, and they should. These are important things. We have to get it right. But it, you know, criticism must be founded on facts. You know, you, you can't just make wild allegations. If there is something in the, uh, in the agreement which enables the flooding in of professionals, then that should be pointed out. You can say this provision in the, in the agreement is going to allow professionals to flood in. And if that is the case, we should think about it. But just to say that professionals are going to flood in and not cite something in the act which is going to allow it, I don't think that's objective. You know, these are very important things which can be of potential advantage to the country. So we must put emotion to one side. We have to be objective. We have to be data-driven. 
And we have to basically look at the facts and get the best deal for the country and not allow um, emotion to get in, uh, in the way and drag us down, as it has done for 70 years now. We need to be far more professional and far more objective in the way we assess the benefits and costs of various public policy decisions. By all means, there should be criticism, but it should be based on facts. Um, so that's, that's the Singapore Agreement. And now, uh, let me, uh, what, taking ASEAN as a whole, I'm sure you've heard from other speakers, you know, that, that it's the seventh largest economy in the world, it'll be the fourth largest by 2050, um, it's, a, it's a, I think, a 2.6 trillion or more economy with 630 million people, the third largest um, labor force, so all that is there as an opportunity uh, if one is to engage with ASEAN. So what, is, what are the specific things that we can do? Uh, I think two things come to mind. One is essentially, what are the value chains we can plug into within the ASEAN region? ASEAN, of course, is not a monolithic entity. You've got Singapore at one end, and you've got uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, Laos, and Cambodia at the other end. Uh, but we need to see whether, with our locational advantages, and our preferential trade advantages, whether we can attract Singaporean investment in here, um, Malaysian investment in here, uh, Thai investment, and in Indonesian uh, investment from ASEAN to help us to plug into value chains. Uh, value chains both in the manufacturing sector, also value chains in the services and logistics sectors. So that's, that's one opportunity. Uh, the second is, if you look at the countries of East and Southeast Asia, a key determinant of their economic transformation has been their capacity to adopt and adapt technology. So I think another real opportunity as far as deepening our engagement with ASEAN is to see whether we can get joint ventures to enable us to adopt and adapt technology and to upgrade our industrial capacity, our logistical capacity, uh, and our services capacity. So those are, I think, two clear opportunities we need to explore. Uh, and there are a number of sectors in terms of the value chains. Uh, some of the sectors that have been, been identified include electronics and components, machinery and parts, transport equipment and parts, um, textiles, as well as, uh, uh, you know, finance, uh, financial services, including fintech, uh, where, of course, Singapore is very much a leader. So these are all opportunities that, that, that exist. Then fi my final point about uh, why ASEAN is an opportunity is that the countries in ASEAN are, are middle-level uh, powers. So you don't get the baggage of the major powers, of the Chinas, the Indias, uh, or the, the US or whatever, because when the major powers come in here, given that the Indian Ocean, uh, the, the strategic dynamics of the Indian Ocean region have changed. Uh, everybody has become interested in us. Uh, but if you, and if you get China in here, if you get India in here, if you get the US in here, somebody is going to get worried about it. But if you bring ASEAN in here, I don't think anybody is going to get worried about it. So that is one advantage of deepening and uh, uh, widening our relationship with ASEAN countries. Uh, because from a geopolitical point of view, uh, it is far more neutral. Uh, there isn't as much baggage. Uh, so that's another significant advantage that ASEAN gives you. So if I can end, I, let me say that uh, Sri Lanka has an opportunity in general. We have to get our macro side right. We have to get our growth framework right. The plans are in place, but we're implementing far too slowly. That needs to improve. And if you look at what ASEAN has to offer, it fits in with our priorities. It fits in with our export um, strategy, our FDI strategy. It fits in with our, our 
a non-aligned uh, uh, international relations strategy, um, and of course, uh, it has strong locational advantages given the fact that they are uh, very much within the region. Thank you all very much. The Governor will answer some questions if you have any because uh, he won't be here for the panel discussion but he's open to any questions if you have any so just raise your arm we will get a, a microphone across to you. Um, Can Sri Lanka be yeah. part of ASEAN? I recall As in the, the country. Sure. I recall in the late 1980s and early 1990s under President Premadasa, we did sound the ASEAN countries out about uh, membership. At that time, it did not work out. But I don't know if there's anybody from the foreign ministry. I think we do have some kind of status uh, within ASEAN. But we don't, for the moment, have. I, uh, I suspect it may be challenging because, you know, ASEAN, the ASEAN Five expanded to take on um, um, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia. And they are in the process of adjusting to that enlargement. So I'm not sure that they will be, at this point, uh, particularly interested in expanding. But I don't think we have to be a member of ASEAN to take advantage of you know, deepened and, and, uh, and widened uh, economic engagement with the region. Uh, I think there are very good bilateral relations with those countries, uh, good government-to-government -government contacts, which we can leverage uh, to our advantage in terms of, of strengthening our economic relations. Previous speaker spoke about out of the 10 countries, we only export to about five countries. Why have we not tapped the balance five countries? That is number one. What about the service exports? Because Sri Lanka have a lot of professionals. Can't we go into that, those markets to services? Have we explored that opportunity? Yes, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, clearly, um, uh, while we may not have exported to the other, uh, the newer members, some of, our in, uh, some of our companies have actually gone into those countries. Uh, we have invested in those. I mean, that's another opportunity which I didn't mention, which I should have done, in that the ASEAN region offers opportunities for our, country, our companies to go and invest. As you know, some of our garments people are in those countries. Some of our uh, finance, uh, financial service providers are in those countries. So certainly, uh, you know, the opportunity is there, both in terms of uh, services uh, as well as uh, investment. Um, now. Export, I mean, you know, it is true we haven't exported uh, very much to those countries, but we haven't exported very much to ASEAN at all. I mean, the total um, exports to ASEAN are less than 5% of our total exports. Uh, given the fact that there is proximity, given the fact that uh, these countries are having a, a large middle class where incomes are expanding, I think that is really a reflection of our poor export performance as a whole. So as our export performance improves, both in terms of goods and services, I think the exports to ASEAN as a whole uh, would grow. Um, sir, thanks uh, very much for bringing uh, Sri Lanka's reserves to this position. Obviously, it's a record uh, what you have done. Uh, but uh, I have a question. Um, since you discussed early 90s exports, uh, Sri Lanka had around $2 billion worth of exports early 90s, and Vietnam also had the similar number two billion dollars but now vietnam is probably hitting 130 130 billion dollars and we are just um, trying to do 12 billion dollars this year uh, what do you think uh, we can seriously work on other than these ftas uh, in order to increase uh, in order to have actually exponential growth rather than linear growth for exports hmm. uh, you know I there was trying to say one is clearly we have to make sure the policy framework doesn't have an anti-export bias. That is the ex uh, exchange rate and power tariffs, et cetera. Uh, the second thing is um, we've uh, export promotion perhaps may not have been as focused as it could have been. Now the national export strategy I think has identified six focus areas uh, and they've also identified four or five pillars in terms of the support 
they're going to give exporters. So now we seem to have a better institutional arrangement to support our exporters. Uh, so this, I mean, that's what we need to do, essentially, to give, give exporters a, you know, a fair run for the money. Don't penalize them through the exchange rate. Uh, don't cut ourselves out from the global uh, uh, production sharing arrangements by sticking paratariffs. Uh, and, and give them uh, you know, the, the support they need uh, in, in, in terms of trying to identify the sectors, in terms of uh, the support services that are necessary for exports. Um, and, and I guess overall also, uh, you know, we have to get the human resources right to support the export sector. Um, electricity charges, our power generation strategy uh, needs to um, drive electricity prices down. Uh, so there are a number of things that come in. Because in the end, to succeed in exports, you have to be competitive. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. Uh, and so that competitiveness agenda cuts right across um, policy, institutions. Uh, and so we need to gear up much better on, on, and on several fronts. I think we are moving in the right direction in a number of areas, but it has to speed up. It has to speed up. All right, thank you very much, Governor, uh, for your speech and also for answering those questions. <laughs> Shedding some light on where Sri Lanka stands at the moment and what we should be doing. Uh, so that leads us to one of the countries that was alluded to by not only the Governor but also the Speaker before that, uh, Vietnam, a success story indeed. And to give us a little more perspective on Vietnam, the success story of Asia, HSBC Bank Vietnam Limited's Head of Wholesale Banking, Mr. Winfield Wong. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. To try to put ASEAN um, with a bit more ASEAN of a flavor, I was thinking of doing a presentation about the story of uh, Vietnam in, in Singlish in the Singapore language as well. So hopefully you'll find this interesting. Um, but let's start with, uh, you know, for myself, when we visit some of the countries and talk to different colleagues as well, very often the question that we ask them, uh, that I ask them is, have you been to Vietnam? And their answer is, oh yes, I've been to Da Nang. And I was thinking, well, Da Nang is a coastal city. It's a four million population, mainly tourism driven economy and uh, if you look far enough, then in the past it was an air base for uh, the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. So there's the, a, a smaller percentage of, of the response will be, oh yes, I've been to Ho Chi Minh City. Well, that's good. Right? Ho Chi Minh City, it's the commercial hub for Vietnam, 7 million population. Very few actually would tell me that they have been to Hanoi, which is the capital for Vietnam. So again, 6 million population there. So, but the good thing is, if you look at Vietnam itself, there are four big cities. The three that I mentioned, plus Haiphong. It's a total of about 20 million population in these big four cities. It's about 70 over million that's living outside of this city. So that gives you a, a, a perspective of the scale of Vietnam. It's a 96 million population. If you compare against Thailand, right, that's about 40% more than the population of Thailand. If you compare against Malaysia, that's three times more the population of Malaysia. But if you look at the GDP per capita, the GDP per capita for Vietnam actually currently stands at 2,300, which is roughly a quarter of what the GDP per capita is for Malaysia. So you can imagine the kind of potential that the country brings. Well, actually, speaking of potential, it wasn't yet now that people realized the potential of Vietnam. I just picked an article called The Economist, right? And this was back in 2016. Um, well, th this was the year that, you know, my boss uh, gave me the chance to work in Vietnam and, and, and run the commercial banking business. So I find it uh, a very interesting period. But uh, the topic was called The Other Asian Tiger, right? Um, and one of the quotes from this article was that with a population of 90 million, 
is actually notched up to be the world's second fastest growth per person, right, since the 1990s, just behind China. And if it were to grow by 7% for the next two decades, it will, and it will be in the same trajectory as South Korea and Taiwan. Now, what was really interesting was one, uh, the, towards the last part of the, state, the, the article, it mentioned that it is quite an achievement. Because back in, the 1990, back in the 1980s, where it was just emerged from Vietnam War in 1975, it was as poor as Ethiopia. So, did it really hit 7%? So, two years since 2016, question was, did it really hit 7%? The answer is that only in the first quarter of 2018, Vietnam's GDP hit 7.3%. Unfortunately, in the last few quarters, it did not. It was hovering around 5.8 to about 6.5% in terms of GDP growth. But Fitch re-rated Vietnam at least three times in the last four years and was just recently upgraded to a double B in May. And I think that this, a lot of credit has been given to not just is it on the right trajectory, but it is actually enjoying a very sustainable growth path as well. And if you look at the components of the GDP growth, you will realize that Vietnam has actually migrated from an agricultural driven industry to a manufacturing base, as well as industrials or even services, as you can see from the chart on the left. So I think it's, it's doing it's getting the right momentum for Vietnam in the last couple of years. Um, what's driving all these growth then? I think the governor has mentioned and he's hit the nail on the head, right? Two things. One, FDI. Two, it's actually manufacturing, and which leads to exports as well. In terms of FDIs, um, as of first quarter of this year, you will see that there's 5.1 billion already uh, registered FDIs into Vietnam, and that's a 6.3 increase year on year. And by the way, in 2017, FDI for Vietnam was 35.88 billion. That's 44% increase compared to 2016. So it's an increase year on year. The question is who are the FDI investors? The biggest are Japan, then comes Korea, and Singapore. But the likes of Thailand, the likes of Malaysia, the likes of Taiwan are always trying to jostle for the top three positions. So they're constantly competing for these top three positions as well. Now, speaking of manufacturing and exports, broadly, just to give you an overview of Vietnam. Vietnam, if you ask you know, some, of, some people, they will tell you Vietnam exports coffee, Vietnam exports pepper. Yes, that's true. But that's history. Today, Vietnam imports refined, uh, refined oil, exports crude. We import bulk of the ICT parts or electronic parts, assembles them, and exports them as finished goods. As the governor did mention as well, um, we are exporting uh, Samsung, LG, for example, you have Note, the Note 8, the Note 9, 60% of the world's supply of the Notes come from Vietnam. Right? Besides ICT, you, of course, you have textile, footwear, as well as many other products as well. Uh, but the point I'm trying to talk about is that the, the industry has actually changed in the last couple of years. What are the growth drivers? Free trade agreements, government stability are key. Right? And I'll talk about this point, uh, what this means in the later slides. But the other aspects are, of course, is demographics. Because I, I touch on 96 million population, you will see that 54 million of them are actually in the right working age as well, with a median age of 31. Not only are they young, not only are they hungry, they are also digitally savvy as well, with 26% uh, internet penetration rate as well. Um, cost competitiveness is there. Uh, that's why you see a lot of textile and garment manufacturing companies moving from China, moving from Sri Lanka to Vietnam, because the average wage is about $300 per person, uh, and that remains very competitive as well. Now, on the point of government, um, and that's a huge difference that the government has made. It's really committed to open up the, the economy with an average, sorry, with about 16 FTAs uh, that has been signed, right? And if 
if it was successful in TPP, it would have made an even bigger difference. But not only on FTAs itself, you will see that they have constantly been trying to encourage investments by amending or improving on, on regulations and policies to attract foreign investments or make business um, operate in an easier manner. So as the evidence and case in point is, for example, you have the World Bank doing business uh, sort of report in 2018 where it is, Vietnam is currently ranked 68 out of 190. And that's actually a jump of 14 ranks compared to two, just in the span of 12 months. You have, in terms of the competitiveness right now, Vietnam is 55 out of 137 economies. Uh, again, an improvement uh, of five uh, places in the last uh, 12 months. I took a slide, uh, and this is a rather outdated slide, it's a kind of free trade agreements that we have signed. Um, you, have see, you will see that uh, with the exception of TPP and hopefully CP, TPP comes in place, but broadly it's very well connected with most of the FTAs um, and that is actually one of the key drivers for the economic progress so far. Now ASEAN was one of uh, the key, I would say, key moves for Vietnam back in 1995. Uh, not only did it join uh, ASEAN, it wasn't a sleeping member, it was rather active, I would say. So broadly, you will see that um, it was the chair for ASEAN Standing Committee in 2000 to 2001. It was also the chair, and then it became the chair for ASEAN um, in 2010 as well. And most notably, ever since AEC was launched in 2015, Vietnam was also recognized as one of the two best countries in terms of implementing of the AEC blueprint. So it's a very active member in the ASEAN space, so it's not just the likes of Singapore or Thailand or Malaysia. And now we get to the crux of the theme for this uh, management forum or the public forum. And I'd like to invite Deshar Dimel, advisor to the Ministry of Finance, who will tell us about the opportunity for Sri Lanka vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN. Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Um, I was hoping to speak about um, how the ASEAN engagement strategy um, with regard to FTAs and other <coughs> means of expanding trade and investment relations in, in ASEAN, how that would fit into Sri Lanka's overall um, growth strategy going forward and why it is necessary to uh, move in that direction. Um, now, the governor uh, spoke earlier, and he has actually covered almost everything that I wanted to say, so this will be like a, a supplementary presentation to what, uh, to what uh, he has already done. Now, the reference was made to the fact that Sri Lanka is in the process of rebalancing uh, our economy, and that is, that is actually a, a, a crucial thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you look at post-war uh, growth in Sri Lanka, it was primarily dominated by um, externally, external debt funded infrastructure uh, spending. So most of the growth was driven by uh, the domestic economy um, oriented uh, sectors. Um, and we didn't have this, the, we didn't have a kind of dynamism in say our export uh, growth levels. Our FDI was generally quite, um, uh, quite static um, as well, averaging about one to, uh, between one and two billion dollars uh, per year in, in most cases. So, uh, what we were seeing in that uh, in that post-war era, and actually, this is a, a, a stemming from the uh, from the late uh, from the late 90s, actually, is that uh, our exports have been um, coming down, uh, but our uh, our external liabilities, because a lot of the the, the borrowing that has been taking place. Uh, has of course had to rely on uh, increasingly on um, external commercial financing, which is a, a natural progression as a country uh, moves beyond uh, the $2,000 per capita level. You have to borrow from, you have to rely more on capital markets. So we saw an increasing level of uh, external liabilities, but our external inflows were on the decline. So it became necessary then to change this, uh, to change this model so that we, look, we, we shift to a different growth path where you are much more oriented towards uh, exports and FDI. So that means our external inflows are really what is, uh, what is uh, driving our growth as well. So there were two, two steps that were required. One was the, 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 the stabilization of the economy that, uh, that the government referenced to as well. And then also to make this shift from a domestic uh, focus of growth to a more externally oriented uh, focus of growth. 
Now, I don't think this slide can be seen, unfortunately. But what it shows is basically that in, in, uh, in graphical form uh, indicating the rise of liabilities and the, uh, the decline on the export side. Now, with regard to stabilization, a lot of uh, ground, a lot of ground has been made in the last uh, in the last 18 months or so. You've seen inflation uh, coming down after hitting quite high levels last year, driven largely by uh, supply side uh, constraints and also external factors. Uh, reserves, as the governor mentioned, has also gone up to uh, historically high levels, which is again going to be very important because looking at the the, the horizon over the next two to three years, we've got significant um, external liabilities that need to be uh, met with the with the bunching of foreign debt um, uh, between 2019 and 2022. Uh, so that reserve position becomes crucial in order to maintain uh, going forward, so that we can go into uh, this challenging time with a, from a position of strength. Interest rates have also been moderating uh, compared to where we were about. Uh, 18 months ago, uh, and also you are seeing uh, an improvement in terms of the external uh, investments into our securities uh, markets as well. Again, in spite of very turbulent global conditions, you've seen with the, the rise of the Federal Reserve's uh, interest rate um, uh, interest rate stance uh, and the expected continuation of that. There's been a lot of uh, volatility in emerging and frontier markets, but Sri Lanka has been able to um, been able to tap in. Uh, uh, quite effectively to um, some of this demand uh, that has been remaining in, uh, in, in, in these markets. So the stabilization of the economy has actually taken on, uh, has moved quite, uh, quite effectively. Uh, so it's the, the stage is now being set to basically attract growth and to take that growth forward in the, in the next few years. Now, the early, the early benefits of this we have already started seeing in the external sector. So we've seen in 2017 we had, uh, Sri Lanka had its best ever year in terms of uh, export earnings and also its best ever year in terms of FDI. Uh, so that is, I think, an encouraging sign with regard to the future outlook on, um, on this orient reorientation of the economy towards the external sector. And hopefully this, uh, these gains can be continued and consolidated uh, going into the next few years as well. Uh, on the labor market, also you're seeing some positive signs with unemployment uh, coming down to, um, uh, to fairly stable levels of around 4%. So we're seeing the early, the, early or the early green shoots in terms of this um, economic activity and this orientation towards uh, exports and FDI. Now, how can, uh, how can government policy tr really take this further and to uh, further embed and consolidate this growth so that we see this turning into a more long-term phenomenon and not just a short-term uh, one-off uh, one kind of outcome? Now, this requires a multi-pronged multi policy approach. Uh, we've discussed quite a bit with regard to uh, free trade agreements and the, the, the demand side of it in terms of uh, creating market access for Sri Lankan products and products originating out of Sri Lanka. But at the same time, a lot of work needs to be done on the supply side as well. It's essential that we, uh, we, we set the policy framework to enable uh, Sri Lankan exporters to have the capabilities of, uh, of tapping into some of these, uh, uh, these emerging markets in, uh, in the East Asian region. And there, are a, a, there have been quite a few uh, policy measures that are being undertaken by the government right now to enable this. Uh, first of all, of the, the macroeconomic stability is a, a, a crucial element of this. Um, but in addition to this, we, we saw um, uh, there's a new national export strategy that has been um, articulated. There's financing for this from uh, in this year's budget as well, where six priority sectors are identified um, for potential export growth and then interventions, identified interventions in, uh, in all of these areas that which, which can expect to, um, to take forward these sectors in the next uh, coming years. And also four cross-cutting uh, um, exportable themes that apply across the board with uh, agnostic uh, to any sector uh, covered. So these are areas like the national quality, uh, the national quality infrastructure, uh, investment in innovation and uh, R&D, the logistics sector, trade promotion, and so on. So all of these areas, we see there are elements of, again, limited government intervention in order to provide, say, things like matching grants or product development and so on, uh, enable to support the underlying uh, su uh, supply side that to enable exports to take off uh, going forward. A similar model is uh, develop, being developed for the innovation and entrepreneurship uh, strategy, again, supporting areas like uh, startups, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, R&D, and so on, again, has financing uh, uh, through uh, this year's budget, and that will continue um, into next year as well. So some of these measures will be important to really change Sri Lanka's current dynamic from this uh, limited, uh, limited sectors that we currently uh, export and we are currently dominated by apparel and tea. So in order to move into these, to the new emerging areas in electronics and 
other more technologically uh, te uh, technologically advanced products, we need to have this uh, greater investment in uh, R&D uh, and su the support of uh, the uh, private enterprise in achieving this uh, as well. Um, in parallel to that, there's also been efforts at uh, unilateral tariff rationalization, so particularly uh, the reduction of para-tariffs is, is an important part of this. In the 2017 November budget, um, there was an announcement that over the next three years, uh, the uh, para-tariffs will be phased out, um, and there was a, that, started, the, the, that process started in November last year with the reduction of 1,200 um, tariff lines where 950 items had the ports and aviation levy removed, and a further 250 items had the CES uh, either removed or reduced uh, quite significantly. So this again is an important element of, uh, of enhancing Sri Lanka's overall competitive, uh, competitiveness uh, and making Sri Lanka an attractive uh, uh, destination for export-oriented uh, investment. And again, the underlying legislative framework is also being strengthened with uh, rules with regard to uh, trade remedies um, and also a trade adjustment package in order to support that process of transition to make it easier for companies to go through this, uh, what can be a tricky process of uh, uh, trade liberalization and opening up to uh, new markets. So now with regard to the reorientation to, uh, to Asia, I say here that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's necessary to, to re-engage with the fast-growing and dynamic uh, Asian market. I say re-engage because in Sri Lanka's post-colonial, uh, sorry, pre-colonial history, we had a lot of, uh, uh, we had a lot of trade with, uh, with uh, Southeast Asia from Batavia in uh, Indonesia um, to uh, the, the Malaysian Peninsula and uh, many other countries in the Southeast Asian region. So this, this is something that Sri Lanka had previously, but we have, uh, we have moved away and the focus has been much more on the uh, European and the American markets in, in recent years. But if you look at the way that global trade is moving, the real dynamism is, of course, in the, uh, in the Southeast Asian and the East Asian regions. And that too, the, the, major, the major growths, the growth we are seeing in exports is in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the value chains. So not in the export of finished products, but in the, uh, in the trade, interregional trade, of uh, parts and components, uh, which is really what has driven ASEAN's growth. So in, in the ASEAN region as well, if you, look, if you go back to the uh, 1980s, it, it was a lot of Japanese investment, that is outward investment from Japan that set up in uh, different countries in the ASEAN region, producing different components of the, either the vehicle industry or electronics, different components in different countries in the ASEAN region, depending on their competitive advantage and then shipping out a final end product. So that is really one of the major drivers of the intra-regional trade in the ASEAN region. Now, Sri Lanka has missed out on this, uh, on this really dynamic part of uh, global trade. So in order to engage with the ASEAN region, it's necessary that we are able to, we are able to also tap into this uh, particular type of uh, trade. So this is where the trade investment nexus becomes uh, the crucial element to it. And, um, this is really what the thinking is behind Sri Lanka's engagement with regard with, through FTAs and uh, with individual countries and then also into the regional level. Um, without further ado, I'd like to invite the Chief Editor CEO of Daily FT, Nista Kasim, who will be moderating this session and covering the export and growth opportunities. And his panel, uh, President of the MB Alumni Association, University of Colombo, Ishan Jaya, Mr. Benfield Wong, Head of Wholesale Banking at HSBC, Mr. Vivek Deshpande, HSBC Regional Head of Sales, Commercial Banking, Global Liquidity and Cash Management, Asia Pacific, Adam Collins, LKI Global Economy Program Research Fellow, Deshal Demel, advisor to the Ministry of Finance, Ranil Patirana, Managing Director of Hydra Money Group, and Hanif Yusuf, Managing Director of Expo Lanka Holdings. We have heard a lot about the opportunities uh, in ASEAN, and I'm happy to introduce two Sri Lankan companies who have really <coughs> uh, didn't, uh, who had seen the potential much earlier than as a country. So I'd like to, uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to invite Hanif Yusuf, uh, Group MD of Expo Lanka Holdings, to share his experience in terms of uh, tapping the ASEAN opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dista. Uh, just to go back, before I go to ASEAN countries, our first venture overseas was 27 years ago, in 1991, to Bangladesh. And uh, to ASEAN would have been close to nine years when we went to Vietnam, Laos. <coughs> so it, it, it's about taking a step way back in 1991 when we saw about, it's about markets. People always say that they are very, as an entrepreneur, we have this passion for business. 
but the question here is that when you have passion for business, so is to know what your market is. And Sri Lankan market, we saw, when you, when you divide into alliance, you have a market which is, has limited scope, and you have a market which has a greater scope. And most people here, and I've been saying that to most of the Sri Lankan entrepreneurs before, way back for the last four or five years, is that we need to cross this line. The line might look like a wall, but it's really not a wall. It's a line that can be bended to move on. So our, our success in 18 countries, but coming back to ASEAN countries, have been phenomenal. If we didn't do that, I think we would have been left out of the entire either shipping or logistics business that we had, uh, opportunity that would have been missed uh, this time. Um, I'll move on to Ranil, uh, Group MD of uh, Hydra Money. Uh, Ranil, what is your experience? Uh, tell, share your own success story as well as some of the challenges. When we went into uh, Vietnam, it was a US uh, customer who wanted us to set up. So they set up the infrastructure and asked us to manage. By that time, Sri Lanka had got a reputation of uh, being good in apparel manufacturing. So our teams went in. And over the last 24, 25 years, it has developed. I think in the last seven, eight years, it has been the largest growth for us in Vietnam. And one of the key things is that uh, the policies are fairly well set. It doesn't change. We have a, a plan. And also the government supports uh, in infrastructure and in all the other facilities possible. So you are seeing Vietnam probably now larger than Bangladesh in terms of apparel exports and growing rapidly. So we also, and also the US, uh, especially the US customers uh, want manufacturing out of Vietnam. Uh, Wong, I just want to. <coughs> Uh, there was reference to about uh, cost aspect. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Vietnam is also people are now going into much cheaper cost like me and my Cambodia. Mm. Uh, how is Vietnam managing that challenge? Mm. So Myanmar, Cambodia has been talked about as potentially being a threat to Vietnam as yes. well. Um, but if you look at the, the state of development for Myanmar and Cambodia, I think it has uh, it needs many more years to catch up with uh, Vietnam, mainly on two aspects, right? One is energy, because when it industrializes, you need a lot of energy. I think these two countries are still very short in terms of uh, energy supply. And the other one is connectivity to ports. Because if you look at geographically, these two countries are actually situa situated more inland, whereas Vietnam has a large coastal line. Uh, which therefore allows the transportation, both in spot, import and export, uh, much more convenient, shorter time, and for businesses that actually translates to cost. Because not every not every product can be freighted by air. Yes. Right? <coughs> Thanks. <coughs> I move on to Vivek before I open it up to the audience. <coughs> Vivek, I mean, um, there is a feeling that uh, from from the presentations that we made that Sri Lanka has been a bit slow. In Canada, um, and uh, given the technology uh, uh, advancement in technology, uh, both in the financial side as well as on the trade, uh, how can Sri Lanka leverage uh, and catch up fast? Okay, so uh, you know, just uh, from uh, I'll speak more in the context of financial services, yeah. and uh, I think the financial services industry is going through an extraordinary transformation right now. And uh, if you were to just look at what's going on in the world uh, and the impact of this transformation, I would just put it in four or five words, which would be certainly much better, smarter, faster, cheaper, and convenient. So that's what we are seeing in our day-to-day -day lives over here. Now, uh, in the fintech space, I really haven't seen much of uh, you know, Sri Lanka startups coming up. Though, uh, you know, in the outside of the fintech space, you see uh, you know, startups like Pick Me or, uh, 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 you know, Karmudi, Lamudi, so these have really made uh, uh, you know significant strides. But if you were to look at uh, what's happened in the world in 2016 alone, more than 17 billion dollars were invested in fintechs, and that's uh, you know phenomenal. And the four key areas where these investments were made were first was uh, you know the biggest was in terms of payments, uh, uh, then in terms of e-commerce thirdly in consumer banking, and fourth in terms of security and, uh, and fraud management. So these are the four areas, but the biggest one that I really want to talk about is about payments and real-time payments. Now, uh, what exactly are real-time payments? Real-time payments essentially is just like, you know, modernization of the existing payment infrastructure. Uh, but 
being done in a way that you know, the credits would be instantaneous, the debits would be instantaneous. At the same time, notification to both the payer and the customer would be at the same time. And it allows, uh, you know, therefore, from a business perspective, the management of AP and AR, the account payable and account receivable, in a much, much more streamlined manner. So uh, that's really which, what is bringing in the, uh, uh, you know, efficiencies for businesses. Now, ASEAN is making a big play in it. So Singapore has launched, uh, for example, the retail uh, pay now proposition, which is again uh, just exactly what I you know, just shared with you. And they're going to be launching the corporate pay now. Similarly, Thailand has uh, you know, launched uh, the prom pay, uh, which is both on the retail side and on the corporate side. So a lot of the ASEAN economies are looking at doing it. Uh, and what uh, you know, the governor spoke about it, and uh, I think Stuart uh, spoke about it, the ASEAN Economic Community, uh, uh, which was formed in December 2015, is talking about financially integrating the ASEAN region as one of the visions. And for that to happen, one of the key building blocks the Blueprint has actually mentioned is the payment and settlement infrastructure enhancement. I want to move to Adam in terms of uh, I think Doug's presentation spoke about a downturn in exports in the next few years. Uh, do you think that Sri Lanka can really increase exports given the general downturn forecast in terms of global trade? Yeah, so it's, it's true that globally trade has not been growing at the rates it was before the global financial crisis for a number of years. Yeah. It picked up a bit last year, yes. but it's still much below that level. Yeah. Um, but Sri Lanka was not really party to that early period of growth. Yes. Now, I think the other risk that's sort of lurking in the background is that greater risk of protectionism and what the US is doing or what the UK is doing. I think the key for Sri Lanka in that context is, given that it exports so much to Europe and the US, the way it can really tap into like renewed export growth is to seek closer ties with regions like ASEAN that are growing very fast, that have a, you know, a growing middle class. So the, and that kind of greater regionalism, the, the free trade agreements are a way to do that, but that's really the way outward looking to other regions, particularly fast growing ones, is the way to sort of address those risks. I mean, as the central bank governor mentioned, sort of turning inward, it hasn't worked in the past for Sri Lanka. Um, so really, ASEAN presents a really big opportunity and something like RCEP, an even bigger opportunity to really <coughs> get into a very dynamic market, even as the risks multiply around the world. Fine. I'd like to move on to Deshal Dimel, uh, the advisor to the finance ministry. In your own opinion, why do you think there is reservations about FTAs among private sector, even though, I mean, the entire day today, People have been talking about the benefits. Uh, and he, how is government trying to fix that fear psychosis? Yeah. So I, I think Sri Lanka's early experience with FTAs, there was a lot of, um, a lot of, I would say, areas where we could have done better than we uh, actually did. So I think uh, a general sense is that, uh, you know, that uh, we might have similar experiences uh, in, in this as well. Um, as I said, though, uh, if you look at our first two trade agreements, India was was um, uh, was signed in uh, 2000, uh, 1998, implemented from 2000. Pakistan a couple of years later. Those are very rudimentary uh, trade agreements. They didn't cover the kind of areas that uh, that modern trade agreements do. So there were a number of areas where uh, subsequently other countries have improved upon their agreements. But Sri Lanka really hasn't engaged in uh, trade trade uh, agreements since that. So um, I think one of the important uh, one of the important processes that the new kind of trade agreements uh, bring in is. Uh, the, the kind of forum to be able to address shortcomings and to be able to, um, to sort out any kind of issues that traders have as well. That framework is important. Um, so I think a lot of this, the fears and the kind of concerns are also due to, I think, shortcomings in communication. Right? I think the government has, uh, has been making attempts to try to improve on that, but still there's a long way to go in terms of explaining the actual uh, provisions of these uh, trade agreements, how they fit into that uh, broader strategy and what measures have been taken to ensure that the national interest has been protected. Okay.
Thanks. So please uh, give a round of applause to the panel for being able to share a lot of things. And thank you very much. And thank you, Nissa. Uh, I just ask um, Ishan Jaya to do the honors by saying thank you uh, to our panelists, especially we'll start off with our keynote speaker who delivered uh, keynote speech for both sessions today. So please come forward. Uh, Mr. Jaya will be presenting you with a token of appreciation for your um, excellently delivered keynote address. Thank you. To Mr. Douglas Lippo, thank you very much. Mr. Stuart Rogers is next. Also to Mr. Vivek Deshpande. I'd like to call Mr. Tusita De Silva to present the next three tokens. Mr. Tusita De Silva. To Mr. Adam Collins. Mr. Deshal De Mel. And to Mr. Ranil Patirana. Thank you, Tusita. Mr. Chaturasi Amalapitiya, could you please say thank you on behalf of the Colombo MBA alumni to Mr. Hanif Yusuf, to Mr. Winfield Wong, and Mr. Tim Evans. Thank you to all those who contributed to make this session an extremely informative one. Thank you once again to our moderator and our speakers today. Mr. Douglas Lipol, our keynote speaker, Mr. Stuart Rogers, Vivek Deshpande, Adam Collins, Deshal Dimel, Ranil Dimel, Ranil Patirana, Mr. Hani Yusuf, and Mr. Winfield Wong. Thank you very much. I'd like to call Chatura Siamala Pitya to propose the vote of thanks. Mr. Irishan Jaya, President, MBA Alumni Association, University of Colombo. Mr. Stuart Rogers, Head of Wholesale Banking, Sri Lanka and Maldives, HSBC. Mr. Nista Kasim. Chief Editor, Daily FT, other distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to offer a vote of thanks on behalf of the MBA Alumni Association, University of Colombo, and Daily FT. This morning, we have, we have had a very fruitful discussion on the prospective future with the ASEAN. And I wish to thank our distinguished chief guest, Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami, Governor Central Bank, of Sri Lanka for his special message, which encouraged us in today's deliberation. I thank Mr. Stuart Roger, head of wholesale banking, Sri Lanka and Maldives, HSBC for being the strategic partner of the event and for sharing his thought with us. I thank our distinguished speakers, Mr. Douglas Lippold, Mr. Adam Collins, Tim Evans, Mr. Winfield Wong, and Mr. Deshal Dimel for spending their valuable time with us today and for enlightening the audience on the subject at hand. There were indeed several points of consideration in their delivery which are of value to the audience. I thank Mr. Vivek Deshpande, Mr. Ranil Patirana, and Mr. Hanif Yusuf for joining in in the very vibrant discussion at the panel, and thank Mr. Nista Kasim for moderating the panel discussion. Our association is grateful to our strategic partner, HSBC, and the staff for the support extended to, me, extended to make this event a success. And I thank Mr. Nista Kasim and Daily FT for being our partner of the event and giving us extensive publicity in the printing media to bring this message to the public. I thank our creative partner, Redworks, for all the creative features to make the event more effective and glamorous. And I thank electronic media partner, Rupuhani Corporation, and the team for their coverage. And I thank corporate ticket solution provider, Omentra, AV Dynamics, and Hotel Shangri-La for their support to make this event a great success. I thank all the EXCO members and other colleagues for their assistance at this event. We thank all participants for taking part in today's discussion. As you know, the MBA Alumni Association, University of Colombo, will have many programs over the year. We shall keep you informed about the future programs and shall be happy if you join us once again. Now I invite you to lunch 
and the fellowship in the adjacent hall. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.